Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Who was that? Just a little later. I like it. Um, just a couple announcements this morning. I, I want you all to know how very pleased I am to see each and every one of you every week. Uh, but what a great opportunity to be in worship with you today. Uh, those announcements for the good of the people this morning. Um, I understand 160 cans of soup for Super Bowl Sunday for our backpack kids. So uh, for our first go around with that uh, type of mission event, what a great success. And I did wonder, we, did, we didn't have anybody here who was truly invested in either one of those teams in the Super Bowl. So I wonder if we had a bit more of a rivalry, we'll have more donations next year. But um, thank you all for donating to that cause. And what a wonderful way to uh, get things started uh, moving into those winter months, or I guess we're in the winter months. But a uh, soup for the kids, but get backpacks. And they get crackers, and they will have a nice meal because of your donation. So thank you for that. Um, just an advance calendar item, uh, March 4th will be the World Day of Prayer service uh, hosted here at Faith Community Church. Several of you have asked about those ecumenical services that happen uh, here in Melbourne. There will not be any other ecumenical services this year, just the World Day of Prayer service that will be here at Faith. Um, and I'm not sure on the time on that even, but just to get that on your calendar, if you want to attend that, um, please add that to your events. Are there other announcements this morning? Um, can we get a microphone? No, yes, maybe. <laughs> it's coming. Yes. Or it's not. Maybe you can yell and I'll repeat what you say. Okay. We just like to make sure those folks at home can hear these announcements. So go ahead, Rhonda. Okay. Um, so the property team committee has been meeting um, several different times to clean out different areas. And so one of the areas that we cleaned out was upstairs. The Hello? Hello? Ooh. Yeah, can, you can hear me? Okay. So one of the areas that we cleaned out is the closet upstairs um, by those pews up there in the balcony. And guess what we found up there? Two podiums from the 1800s. So we're thrilled to death about that because we cleaned it out. We're going to clean those podiums off and we want to put them down in the room. We're just calling it history room for right now, but we want to clean that room in the basement and we're going to paint it, make it welcoming, put in all kinds of things that are very memorial to us as a church, and I think it's going to be really cool. So what we did find is a whole bunch of folding chairs that the church does not need. So we moved those down to the overflow room over here. And Tom, I think we're just saying if you want some of those chairs, take them. If that, is that okay with, with everybody? Just, I mean, there's chairs that we just don't need. And so the whole idea is to try to keep the memories but get rid of the stuff, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements this morning? All right, I'm going to call you to worship this morning by asking you to have a time of prayer. Um, like I say, every week, let's take a, a moment to get rid of anything that's standing between us and God, anything that's kind of holding us back from true worship this morning. Would you be in a time of silent prayer?
Lord, guide us and fill us with your presence. Amen. Let's join in some praise this morning. I'll invite the praise team to come forward. We're going to start with, uh, we will glorify the King of Kings. It's in the faith we sing, the little black books in your uh, hymnal racks there. Let's stand and sing together some praise. Okay. How many of you like to kiss? How many of you like to kiss other people? How many of you like to be kissed by other people? 
How many of you are saying, you're just not sure, and let's be, we've got one or two are in the back, right? Um, thinking nobody knows they're back there, but uh, how many of you say, well, you're just not really sure, I need to be a little bit more specific? That would cover many of you, I think, just kind of depends on the situation. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been telling you the Bible is full of kissing. That's what we're talking about all month long. Uh, and we've talked about greeting one another with a holy kiss. Um, we've talked about the kiss of God. We've talked about what a kiss might mean to us. And uh, there again, when we, we talk about a holy kiss, um, I wasn't necessarily intending that you kiss every person you meet here this morning, but we talked about what it means to show that affection and that love and that acceptance with the love of God. Um, biblically speaking, those are kisses that we would want. But how about the kisses that we don't want? Uh, where are those in the Bible? Last week I talked about some folks that were kissing a, a calf idol. We said we don't, we don't want to do that. I'm um, going to give you some other uh, scriptures. Proverbs uh, chapter 7 tells about a woman catching the attention of a young man. It says she took hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, I came out to meet you. I've looked for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. And maybe there's a few guys here saying, well, that doesn't sound bad, right? <laughs> but here's what she says next. My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. This passage is often referred to as the kiss of an adulteress. She's not a very nice person, but she knows how to kiss, so the man goes with her. And the writer of Proverbs tells us, do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Does that sound like a kiss you would want us to sign up for? In 2 Samuel chapter 20, we're told that there was a man uh, who led a rebellion against King David. And the general of that rebellious leader was a man named Amasa. And he was apparently related to the general of David's army, a man named Joab. And when Joab met Amasa out in the open field, Joab pretended to be a friend and a relative to him. It says he then took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And then he took his dagger and stabbed him to death. Of course, there is the most infamous kiss of all, that which Judas used to betray Jesus. Matthew 26 tells us, now the betrayer, Judas, had arranged a signal with them. He said, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus rep replied, friend, do what you came for. And the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Now our focus text this morning, Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6, that also has something to say about kisses. Uh, the King James Version is printed on the front of your bulletin this morning. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Uh, another translation from the message paraphrase, it says, the wounds from a lover are worth it, Kisses from an enemy will do you in. Uh, maybe you're using the New International Version. It says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Uh, side note, the word deceitful here in the Hebrew, uh, probably better translated as abundant, multiplied. Uh, this kind of enemy doesn't just kiss you, he multiplies his kisses. It speaks of someone who does more, who does bigger, who does more numerously than normal, uh, thus saying this deceitful person overdoes it in order to cover the dishonest nature of his or her 
actions. Now we've discussed um, in our day and time, in our current culture, people don't kiss each other as much as friends did back then in Bible times, greeting one another with a holy kiss. Um, and is there anyone here that greeted everyone with a kiss this morning? No, we just don't do that in our current culture. But back then, an enemy would have kissed you to deceive you into believing that he actually liked you, that he was your friend, that he wanted to help you, and of course, he doesn't. But he would like you to think that. Uh, I came across a poem once in Reader's Digest, of all places. O oh, victim of Cupid, remember this terse little verse. To let a fool kiss you is stupid, but to let a kiss fool you is worse. Now back in Bible times, enemies would kiss you to fool you. Nowadays, I think if an enemy started kissing on me, I'm, I'm not sure I would be fooled. I'd be weirded out. I'd probably call the cops or something. But I don't know if I would be fooled. Uh, in our culture, as I said, people don't commonly kiss. It wouldn't work today like it did back then. So I want us to really dig into this passage and what it does mean to us today. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I started by asking you if you like to kiss. Some of you weren't sure. I have to think about that. What if I were to ask you, which would you rather have, wounds or kisses? I could, you want to sign up? Who wants to be wounded? Who wants to be kissed? Without more information, I think just about any of us would say, a kiss. But when this proverb is through with us this morning, we might want to rethink that answer. So let's play a little bit this morning. I want to give you something to think about. Let's say that you see one of your fellow congregation members in the foyer here this morning, and you chat a bit before the service. Doesn't seem that unusual, right? As you head for the sanctuary, that Christian brother or sister is a few steps ahead of you, and you notice about a foot and a half long piece of toilet paper stuck to their shoe and trailing behind them. Do you say anything? What if the back of their skirt is tucked in their pantyhose? And you're like, nobody wears pantyhose anymore, that one won't work, okay. What if you're chatting with that friend out in the entryway and they share with you that today is the day they are going to stand in front of the congregation and share their faith story and they're so excited about it and you're really getting drawn in by that but as they're telling you all of this, you can't help but notice their zipper is down. And not like a little bit, like the barn door is wide open, right? Do you risk temporary embarrassment between the two of you to tell them, hey, your zipper's down, uh, in order to spare your friend the larger scale humiliation of standing in front of the entire congregation with their barn door open, being broadcast online with their zipper open, do you say something? What if, just what if, the person you're in conversation with, I'm just gonna say it, has a booger in their nose, a bat in the cave, right? And you're trying not to look, and you're trying not to... And they're like, yeah, I'm going to go up and lead the praise team today. Do you say something? Be honest. What would you do? What would be the kind thing to do? What would you want someone else to do if that barn door was yours, if the toilet paper was stuck to your shoe? Would you want a friend to tell you? Would it hurt a little bit? Now these issues, while potentially embarrassing, kind of minor in the big scheme of things. Let's, let's try this one on for size. You go out for pizza with a group of friends. Um, better yet, you are with a group of friends from church and you've just participated in a mission event and you're on your way home and you're gonna stop for pizza. And 
the waitress at the restaurant you're at, she's especially busy that night. She seems really overwhelmed. The place is packed. And when she delivers the drinks to your table, she has gotten the order completely wrong. Nobody's getting the right thing to drink. And a member of your group, one of your close friends, loudly enough for all in proximity to hear, says to your server, how hard is it to take a drink order? I have a two-year-old grandson at home that could do better than that. What do you do? What if your best friend, a friend you've had since elementary school, says, hey, do you want to ride along with me to my son's wrestling meet? And you happily agree, because this has been your friend, a lifelong friend, you've always supported each other, you've always done your best to attend all the events and parties of each other's kids, and yeah, I'll, I'll ride along. It's a two-hour drive, and about halfway through, you stop at a convenience store to get some gas and grab a few snacks, and your friend says, hey, pop and candy bars are on me, no arguments. So you graciously accept the offer. You're standing at the counter and the cashier asks your friend for the total, $7.26. You see your friend give the young man behind the counter a $10 bill. And then you watch that young man give your friend change for a 20. And your friend looks at you, smiles, puts the cash in her pocket and heads for the door. What do you do? Do you say something? What would you say? Our scripture says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. What is a faithful wound? To be faithful here means to provide stability and patience. The faithful wound of a friend will help us be built up, supported, nurtured, and established. And you're saying, I don't really think of wounds as being nurturing. But here we're speaking of the wound of a friend, not a wound on a battlefield. Our friends wound us when they know that difficult words must be said. They don't take any pleasure in wounding us. Unfortunately, they see the need to make a difficult statement, a correction, a word of warning about something that they see in our life. They say it to prevent problems, not cause them. They see that the wound is necessary in the short term because greater damage will result in the long term without it. So they speak, and they risk misunderstanding, and they risk offense, and they risk making us embarrassed or angry, yet they see that they're wounding us out of love. They're not speaking to hurt us, they're speaking to help us. And they see that not speaking, not wounding us, would be even worse. In fact, not speaking would be the most unfriendly thing they could do. So faithful are the wounds of a friend. Got it. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The kisses are those of an enemy. Enough said? I think it might help us to see how they're described. An enemy gives only deceitful kisses. We learn right off the bat that we can't trust actions alone. The outward can be deceitful. As God often says, the issue is in our heart. I mentioned the Hebrew word for deceitful actually means abundant. We're talking about somebody who is really going overboard with affection in an attempt to disguise hatred. And I wish you could all tell me that you have no idea what I'm talking about. I wish you could say, nope, you've lost me. But I'm guessing most of you have either experienced or witnessed this type of behavior. It's one thing to have someone openly be rude to you, start a fight, come out and say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with you, I don't like you. But it's a different thing when there's dishonesty and manipulation and betrayal. 
An enemy may not ever be direct with their hatred. They'll even use flattery and kisses to cover their animosity. I can't help but read this text without remembering Judas. Betraying Jesus with a kiss, a kiss that was inauthentic, fake affection, a lie. True friends don't need to constantly flatter us. They don't need to constantly heap on affection to the point of overboard. Makes us understand we should always be wary when dealing with someone who is doing that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What are we learning? We can learn that when someone's giving us far more affection and congratulation than normal, we might want to be careful about basking in their adulation. It might be deceitful in nature. They might have ulterior motives behind it. We also learn to accept the wounds of our friends as gifts rather than just those annoying comments. This is one time where it is better to receive a wound than a kiss. The wound is given only for the purpose of blessing us in the end, but the kiss, only a prelude to something worse. And just like I've titled my message today, you don't want those kisses. And you can say, no, I don't. And I won't be fooled. But guess what? What if you do get fooled? Face it, uh, flattery works. There are people out there who will use it to manipulate you, either because you have something that they want or because they dislike you for something that you've said or done or something that you stand for. And that flattery and those compliments, those kisses. Sometimes the act is so smooth We don't see it coming. We get caught up in feeling great about ourselves because they've built on what they think we want to hear about ourselves. Smooth. And it's tough. It is tough when someone that you thought you could trust betrays you. Someone who was close to you, and then they hurt you. And they hurt you so bad, so badly, that they become your enemy. And now you have to figure out what to do with them. You're certainly not going to trust them anymore. In fact, you might start thinking about how to repay them for what they've done to you. You might give some thought on how you can hurt them like they've hurt you. Believe me, I understand that. I'm a human being. But before you get your revenge all plotted out, here's what it says in Romans chapter 12. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So God is saying, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. And to top it off, Jesus says more than once in the Gospels, we are to love our enemies. Pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Now's the part where you say, come on, pastor. What is going on today? First you tell me I want to be wounded. Then you tell me I don't want to be kissed. Now we're saying I need to show love and kindness to the people who treat me like garbage. What's the end game here? How does any of this work out? Well, friends, let me see if I can land this, tie a bow on it, and have it make sense. I am not saying it will be easy. But there's something we may be missing in all of this, something I really want you to add to how we apply this proverb. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. God works in all things for good. How many things? All of them. The King James Version, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
all things. Even the kisses of an enemy? Yep. Even the actions of those who have betrayed us? Yep. What about those who have hurt us and abused us and sold us out? God can work in those things for good? Yep. Even those. Even and especially the story of Judas. A man who you would have thought Jesus could have trusted, one of his disciples, his inner circle. A man who instead took money to sell Jesus into captivity, to be tried, to be beaten. A man whose kiss condemned Christ to be nailed to a cross. It was the kiss of an enemy that led Jesus to Calvary. It was the act of a betrayer that led to our salvation. All things work together for good. God can bring good from all things. Will you accept the wounds of a faithful friend for your good? Will you be wary of those deceitful kisses for your good? And ultimately, no matter how our friends or enemies treat us, no matter the situation, will you do your best in all that you do and say to please God and to trust him to bring good from all things? My prayer is that you will. Friends, let's pray. Gracious Lord and Savior, we are so thankful for your word. We pray that your teachings will lead us in our actions, lead us in our understanding, guide us in our mission, in our relationships with others, with ourselves, with you. Come into our hearts. Lord, come into our hearts and show us the way. It's in your name we ask it. Amen. If you would again take out the faith we sing, we're going to join in Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. It's number 2140 in the faith we sing. Uh, I will allow you to make your own decision as to how you're most comfortable sitting or standing but I'll ask that you choose the option that has your voice the loudest for me to hear. Okay? I want to hear you praise today. So let's, let's sing together.
time of prayers of the people, I will ask if you've got joys or concerns that we might lift up to the Lord this morning. Uh, we've got those special prayer requests printed for you in the bulletin, as well as those suggestions throughout the week, uh, offering the reminder that those folks that uh, their names appear there, that's because they are part of this church family, not for a specific prayer request, but uh, the who and what else can I pray for this week. We're trying to uh, keep people mindful uh, that we do need to pray for one another and lift one another up throughout the week. Uh, I did have the opportunity to speak with Pauline Hodge uh, this past week. She watches us every week. She likes to hear her name here. So um, I, I would suggest a one, two, three, hi, Pauline. Are you up for it? Yeah. One, two, three. Hi, hi Pauline. <laughs> Um, she has shared with me that, that yes, she still is in a, a state of hospice care, and uh, she kind of jokingly said to me, she said, I think I'm a fraud because everybody's thinking I'm really bad, but I'm still here. <laughs> and um, she does experience some, some significant shortness of breath, but she really has no pain. And so we will give thanks uh, for that blessing. We don't know if that will continue to be her situation, but... Uh, friends, I would encourage you to reach out to her with your well wishes, with your cards, and uh, she, she does have her cell phone with her if you'd like to make a call. She sometimes is up for conversation, sometimes not, but she would love to know uh, that we are thinking of her, and she feels very much a part of our family. So Pauline, we love you, and uh, we're glad you can worship with us each week. So, Are there others we might lift up to the Lord in prayer this morning? Yes. We have a real mess going on in Europe, and I just pray that those who've been talking will start listening on both sides. We're a bunch of innocent people here. That's my prayers. Absolutely. He's, he's asking prayers for a global, uh, perhaps, peacemaking, but particularly in the European countries where there is struggle and strife. Um, I would join you in that prayer as well. Others, do you have joy in your life? Did someone kiss you this morning? Do you want someone to kiss you this morning? Are you scared about kissing now? Have you had enough? Oh, Chuck. <laughs> Are you feeling that uh, you have been greeted with a holy kiss here this morning? Yes? If not, talk to me afterwards. We can, we can fix that. Uh, the Winkowitches, back with a tan. Glad to have you with us. Um, I did get the postcard that said, I'm in my happy place, and I put it on my refrigerator. And uh, we're glad to have you back, but glad you could enjoy a little time on vacation as well. So good to see you. Anybody want to make Levi run? He is ready. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, God. We bow before you. We come before you with grateful hearts, full of thanksgiving, recognizing the blessings you have bestowed upon us being reminded in your word that you work for good, that you can bring good from all things. Would you help us to perhaps persevere in such a way as to understand that, and not just perseverance, but maybe peace that might be brought into our lives and understanding that. Lord, we've been talking an awful lot about kissing around here. What it means to let others know that they are cared for, that we have love and affection and acceptance to offer all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as those who may be searching. We join you, Jesus, in that mission to seek and save the lost. For those who have struggle in their lives, Lord, whether that is physical illness, whether that's emotional or spiritual or mental distress, whether that's just stuff at work, stuff at school, just stuff, Lord, brokenness. Help us to get out of your way so you can repair some damage. Help us to understand our role and how you work through us. 
fill in the gaps for us, Lord, so that we might become whole, that we might understand how your presence offers that mending that only you can offer. We do pray for healing, Lord. Understanding that always uh, can mean something different. It doesn't necessarily end with the stamp of approval saying you are cured. That means you are healed. That's what we're looking for. That assurance, that peace, uh, peace that surpasses understanding. We thank you for the times of celebration in our life, for those around us who have lifted us up and have joined us in this journey of faith. And we pray for those who need your presence, knowing that means all of us, Lord. Be with us on the path you have chosen for us, now and always. It's in your name we ask it. Amen. As a send you out from worship? How might I inspire you and encourage you, understanding that God is the one doing the work, and uh, I just need to relay that to you? Um, How many of you, just not asking anyone to come forward or say a word, how many of you feel that you have a personal faith story, a moment in your life where you really recognized inviting Jesus into your life? How many of you want that? Ooh, got my work cut out for me. I often think back to my own experiences as well as shared experience with others, stories that I've heard, and I I always come to this conclusion that perhaps the best prayer of all is to ask God into your heart, to know the gift of salvation, to know the the wonder of living forever with God, to understand the assurance that Jesus is always beside you. And then I realize that prayer doesn't end there. It never does. That's a prayer that we pray every day, but there's also more to it. We add to it the plea for inspiration and encouragement to share what we have in our heart with others, to share who resides in our heart with others. As you leave, as you go on your way, may God bless you as we all together strive to further his kingdom here on earth. Be blessed. Amen. Let's stand and join in our closing hymn, again in the faith we sing, number 2160, Into My Heart.
Thank you.